Hello everybody, my name is Jimmy Smith and welcome to another Wine with Jimmy session on understanding part of the Level 3 WSET syllabus. This one is part two on the WSET Level 3 port syllabus. So this is uh, the um, after the part one, we looked in the vineyards, that's on a separate video, the link will be in the description below this video. Um, but this is part two, looking at the winery, and there will be a part three on the styles. Um, part three is only available to members of our online portal. So you can sign up uh, by using the link at the bottom of this video in the description. So we have a wonderful online portal, which has more video content. It has multiple choice questions, about 750 of them. It has flashcards and it has uh, lots of um, uh, mock written questions and answers. It's a really useful portal for, uh, for you to help you prepare yourself for the level three exam, just like these little videos are as well. So those of you that don't know me, my name is Jimmy Smith. I am at Wine with Jimmy on YouTube, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I own two wine schools in London, West London Wine School, South London Wine School, and a wine bar called Streatham Wine House uh, as well. Okay, so this is on the um, the winery, the winemaking part of Port. There in the picture, you will clearly see a Villa Nova de Gaia, which is opposite Oporto, uh, on the estuary of the Douro River. Um, so a very typical picture here of, um, of the end of the Douro's route as it heads from the Sistema Reberica, uh, which is in sort of north central Spain, and all the way into Portugal, and then finally to the Atlantic. Um, you'll see the bottom right here, there are some wonderful shallow boats called Barceros Rebelos. These are these old boats that used to bring all of the barrels of port down from the Douro Valley to here, to be stored in the wonderful port houses here. Uh, today, this is done by more modern means, but they are still found on the river because lots of the tourism is built around that. And, and you'll also see here, I'll identify some of these for you. I'll do this in a black arrow, hopefully we can, but you'll see many of the names here. So um, you have Offley just up here. You have Offley again in the background here. Sanderman is just uh, just here. Um, Kopche is just down here as well. Calum is down here. Lots of the... Um, key names you'll see of the port lodges that are situated here and we're going to learn why we're going to learn why they tend to be here and not up where the wine uh, the vineyards are um, and it's all to do with their aging process of course um, so we will have a written question at the end of this it's not a full written question but a partial one where i will work through the question uh, and you can understand exactly what wset may ask in the examinations and how you should look to structure your answers. Okay, so let's move on to our next bit here. So just so uh, we've seen this before, if you have seen the first video, part one on port, which the link to that is also in the description below this video. Um, you, we, we would have seen this video, uh, sorry, this um, map before. So this is of Portugal, and we are, of course, looking at um, the Douro Valley. Now, the Douro Valley is where we focused on in part one, because that's where the vineyards are located. Um, and that is a very important area protected by the Serra de Mareo, which is the mountain range um, protecting it from the Atlantic. But in fact, this time around, we are looking here, um, mostly here. We still will talk about the Douro Valley a little bit, but we are looking at the city of Oporto and Villa Nova de Gaia. Uh, so this is on the estuary of the Douro River as it meets the wonderful, big, vast Atlantic. And this is ideal because, of course, this is the cooler area, uh, which means that the aging is more gentle um, and not so uh, intensive as it would be in the Douro Valley. The Douro Valley, where some ports are aged, um, is much warmer uh, and the, the wines there will mature much quicker due to the heat conditions. So that's why they do tend to find them down in a Porto, for instance. OK, so. Um, so, yes, we are 70 kilometers downstream from the Douro Valley in Oporto. 
Uh, and we're going to talk now about the winemaking. Now, from the end of part one, we talked about uh, the grape varieties, um, of which you need to recognise. You don't need to be able to really talk about them so much, but recognise them certainly for multiple choice. Um, so we're talking about those grape varieties coming into the winery, and then what happens upon reception in the winery, and then through its fermentation, fortification, and maturation. That's the processes that we will start to work through here. So first of all then, um, is the beginning points of fermentation. Now, um, at this stage, you will actually start to produce the wine as normal. So you would start to, to ferment it as normal. Um, so this will be placed uh, often in big open uh, vats called lagares, or it may be in stainless steel, absolutely depends on the producer. And it will start to ferment um, as normal, and it will reach an alcoholic level of around sort of five to nine percent alcohol by volume. So you're looking at somewhere around sort of um, sort of 30 to 60 percent of the fermentation complete depending on the producer and how much sugar. Um, it can't go much more above that because there won't be enough sugar left behind as residual sugar to classify it as a port because it needs a fair bit of sugar behind it. Um, then the fortification will occur. We're going to come to that a little bit later because we actually need to talk about what may happen during the fermentation before this fortification. But this picture shows you here that you have the wine and you have some spirit being added to it as well, which is the fortification. Much smaller pipe there, as there's a much smaller amount of that fortification. But, but that is um, basically its fortification. Now, we'll come back to that in a second. So we're going to talk about what may happen during fermentation. Um, and the principal, principal thing you need to understand is that, that this isn't a full fermentation. So when you're making normal, still red wine, you ferment up to dryness, okay? So maybe you have a potential alcohol of somewhere around 13%, and you fully ferment up to 13%, leaving little or no residual sugar left behind. And that makes, of course, a dry red wine. We know that port is sweet, so the um, the area, the, the ability to get it to sweetness or keep its sweetness is by stopping the fermentation early, and that's by that addition of fortification. So that means that that fortification will happen at around five to nine percent, not at 13 or 14 percent. So it happens during its fermentation, during its fermentation. So um, that means that you need to really extract the color, the tannin, and the flavor from the skins of the grape in a much shorter time scale, because you are not running a long fermentation of weeks. Um, you are running a, sh a short fermentation of really one to two days. So you need to be able to extract as much as you possibly can in that short period of day, uh, uh, time, one to two days, um, by maximizing extraction. So there, that is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about two major methods and then two sub-methods of ways that wineries here in northern Portugal will maximize extraction during that short fermentation uh, process. So let's go through those. Now, the most obvious one to begin with is certainly the traditional one. We always should begin with the most traditional style. And here you see a group of which looks like all men. Um, it doesn't have to be all men, but we have uh, a group of people who are in an open-aired lagar. And a lagar is a, a, this kind of granite um, open-aired trough or vat uh, of which the grapes are placed into this. Uh, and basically what happens is um, you know, these men will get in, these people will get in, uh, and they um they for around three to four hours will actually tramp uh, trample the grapes they will press the grapes crush those grapes um the fermentation will eventually begin after around three to four hours and that's when they'll exit it basically because carbon dioxide will be given off as a byproduct and it becomes quite a dangerous environment for a load of people to be milling around in. Um, you may see also at some sort of press events and uh, fairs and social events, 
that this will happen, but then there's something called the Libertad, which is declared, the freedom, where people move around freely. They start to move very sort of um, structured uh, methodologically, and they move up and down, arm in arm, as you can see, but the Libertad is declared, they freely run around, and if there's cameras um, taking lots of pictures, you might even have a folk band in there and people dancing around to crush the grapes. It's quite a lot of good fun. Um, so you have uh, crushed these grapes. Now, one thing to immediately realize is this traditional method um, is in fact the benchmark against which all other methods are judged and manipulated to be like. So um, all these modernizations of uh, ways of extracting color, tannin, and flavor as much as possible is by mimicking often uh, this process. Um, there is some different ones, but a lot of them will mimic it or try to extract as much um, of the extraction as possible, the color, the tannin, and the flavor. So this is today done for fine ports, small batch ports, small wineries, and for press and for you know, for, for the cameras and for the fairs. Um, not everybody does it, but it certainly is something which is still seen as mightily important. Um, another method, of course, with modernization, something was created called an, called an auto vinifier. So this is one of the first inventions to automate the extraction process. Um, crushed grapes are put in into these sealed vats, and you can see here in this picture. So what's here um and i can sort of outline this for you let me draw a bit of a line and that will help you a little bit here but this whole area here is where the crushed grapes will be put in okay so that's what's sitting here okay and that top part here is called the cap because that of course will contain the pips the skins um and so on as they are less dense than the juice they rise to the top um so really what this is designed to do is to maximize the um the extraction from that cap by maximizing contact with the juice and that is by utilizing what is given off naturally from fermentation which is the carbon dioxide so let's just um chat through exactly what happens then so so those crushed grapes are put in that sealed vat as i just outlined them um, there is some rising pressure of carbon dioxide here because, of course, you've got fermentation and that pushes the must up pipe B. So let me show you where that is. So the must then comes up here, okay, and then comes into this holding tank. Uh, so this is what we call holding tank. Holding tank. It's actually labeled as number one here. Okay, so it's then in the holding tank. Now, when a certain pressure is obtained, there is a valve just here. This is valve C. Uh, and valve C is released. Uh, and the wine in holding tank um, one, uh, this little um, faucet here is opened and it gets pushed down here where it then sprays over the cap very aggressively uh, indeed. So um, it's able to extract lots of color this way, lots of tannin and lots of, um, and lots of flavor. Um, it resets itself, the valve, every 20 minutes or so uh, and therefore it will therefore go through this process every fifth every sort of 15 to 20 minutes or so very efficient very good way of extracting all of what you need from the cap uh, and in essence it's um, a kind of a more um, automated process of pumping over um, but using that natural carbon dioxide uh, and some very nifty technology to actually push it and submerge it uh, and really keep the cap moist but extract what you need. So that is an auto vinifier and quite widely used as well. Okay, um, then we have uh, sort of two uh, not as widely used but sub processes which are robotic lagars and piston plungers. Um, so this is at Graham's in the picture here. Both are designed to imitate the the traditional method, which is foot treading. Piston plungers were are these kind of round, shallow, open-topped stainless steel vats where the cap is pressed down with actual sort of pistons and it's, it's continued pressed down. But in this picture here is a robotic lagar, another one. And this involves the use of shallow and rectangular stainless steel tanks, similar size to the lagar that you will find in um, the traditional. Uh, but then this long wall here, which has got lots of doors on it, has lots of paddles and feet below it. And these are like robotic feet that imitate the human action. So the way that the feet will actually crush it in the traditional method. Okay, so, so there you have um, 
four methods, two major methods that you will need to know. So the foot treading, the traditional way, the auto vinifying, and then these ones, the robotic lagar and the piston plunger. Remember that they're all designed to extract very quickly extraction of the juice. So that is uh, the skins, sorry, of, um, of tannin, flavor, uh, and, and, and color as quickly as possible because really you have uh, around 24 hours to 36 hours to extract this. Uh, so it's a very, um, a very, very uh, a quick process. So we get to our point where um, fortification will come in. So we've maximized the extraction at this point. We have what we need in color, tannin and flavor. Um, fortification is added. So this fortification is a spirit of 77, or well, up to 77% ABV called Arguadente. And let's just scribble that down uh, at the top. Sorry, let me change the, the slide, which I should have done. Um, here we go. Du, du, du. So in this picture, you'll see this. So Arguadente. Okay, usually about 77% ABV. Okay, so let's get the uh, arrow just to point at this. That's what's going on just, just here, Arguadente. So uh, that is added. Um, it's probably about a 20th of the total amount of wi wine size, uh, size of the vat here. And the fermentation gets up to um, five to 9% ABV, but you still quite, you use quite a lot of this spirit. You know, approximately about 15 to 20% of port is actually spirit. And if you compare this to something like another, another fortified wine, like uh, Fino, for instance, that's only really three-ish percent of spirit. So there's much more spirit found in ports than most sherries. Um, so it is a bit more of a spirity, heady kind of a drink. Um, so, of course, that fortification, which is very, very high strength, will kill the yeast, which is which was working on the sugar. Um, and that spirit that you've added will bump up the alcohol, which would be about five to nine percent ABV in the wine. But it'll bump it up to somewhere around 19 to 22 percent ABV. You've created basically a stable sweet wine at that point because it's going to have residual sugar left behind. No more yeast is there. It's died because, of course, you have um, you've killed it by the very strong spirit you've added. But you've also fortified the wine, making it very stable. Um, and this is process is something which has been carried out by a lot of the big European um, uh, you know, trading nations of the past, specifically the Dutch, but of course the Portuguese, the Spanish, the British, the French, um, all instigated this really to stabilize their wine so they would actually survive the sea journeys, you know, for transport. And it created a different style of wine, but a stable wine, which is, um, which is very important. Um, so that is your fortification. So the result of this is that you have a stable sweet wine somewhere around 20% ABV uh, and of course it's dark and red in color for most of the styles. Um, then will come maturation and we're going to talk about location uh, on this uh, and we'll talk about the vessels as well but we won't go into um, the actual specific styles that is saved for part three, which is available to all members of the Wine with Jimmy uh, e-learning platform, which you can access on www.winewithjimmy.com. So the maturation uh, here is, uh, we've got another picture up of uh, Villa Nova de Gaia. Um, and most ports are aged here, as, uh, as I identified on the first picture of the presentation. It's cooler. It has that maritime influence, and this ensures a very balanced, moderated, and uh, slow maturation. Uh, so that's classic for a lot of ports. Most ports will go come down here, be transported down, and will age in these in this much cooler area. And if you haven't been, Oporto is a lovely sort of almost like a little bit like Britain. It's a bit sunnier, but it gets the cool breezes, which are gorgeous, and it can be quite rainy as well. Um, but there are, of course, other start types of ports, certainly tawny ports, which can be aged in the Douro Valley. So that's upstream beyond 70 kilometers where it's much, much hotter. Certainly if you get 
beyond Rejua towards Pinal, you get very hot conditions. And these hot conditions, if there's no air conditioning, for instance, will mean that the tawnies will age quicker and you'll get more of that kind of cooked element to the wine, a little bit like a Madeira, I suppose. Um, but of course, with the invention of air conditioning um, and also mass air conditioning in warehouses and factories, this has allowed more and more wines to be aged on the vineyard, next to it, whatever it may be, but up in the Douro Valley. So that has been a bit of a modern approach to it. It's basically expansive cellars, I suppose. Um, and the types of vessels that we may use uh, for this maturation, which will lead us uh, into part three. Um, but we have um, basically two types of ports. We have the red ports and we have the brown ports, so what we call the ruby ports and the tawny ports. OK, uh, and it's quite wonderfully obvious. And I know a lot of you have been studying WSET and there's lots of intricacies about learning about this great variety and this. And, you know, Vina Noble de Montepulciano is not Montepulciano, it's Sangiovese and all these kind of things, these kind of um, weirdisms. This is very straightforward. The ruby ports, I put a big round red ruby circle there because they are called ruby ports because they look ruby red. Um, they are produced in methods to minimize oxidation um, and they are generally quite short amounts of aging, maybe one to three years in very large old oak vats, often holding 10 to 50,000 litres of wine. They are quite epic or stainless steel even and that's really to minimize that oxidation to produce a rich dark um, ruby port um, you will get deep colors of course you will get primary characteristic characteristics often pronounced black fruits are very common black cherry black currant with licorice and black pepper is often and very common with a lot of the ruby based ports. Now there are lots of different types of ruby ports, including reserve ruby, late bottle vintage, vintages which start their life off as ruby, but they will be discussed on part three. The um, next one down is the brownish style ones, the tawny. Tawny is kind of like a red to brown color for wines. Uh, and these are wines that will undergo plenty of oxidation uh, and that is maximized. So maximized in things like on the left in this picture. These are generally um, small pipes uh, or, or small and more shallow barrels traditionally, but they can be more generic barrels today. Um, and this aging maximizes oxidation. The wines have a bit more transparency behind them. You'll often uh, find, that, of course, they're kind of like a, a pale or mid tawny. Um, and they have very distinctive tertiary and secondary notes as well, but things like caramel, walnut, um, dried uh, red fruit, marzipan, almond, uh, and even some oak-based characteristics as well will come through with the tawnies. But they are designed to really um, be that kind of style. They are wonderfully complex, and, and the age-indicated examples probably are some of the finest um, ports out there. Okay, so that, uh, that is your vessels done. Um, we're now just going to go through a few questions just so you can understand what potentially WSET could ask and then how you should really look to answer those questions. Um, so first of all, you have a label here on the left-hand side. Those of you that haven't uh, watched many of these videos, it is a good a real good bit of practice to get as many labels as you can from the internet and start to just answer what this wine style is in terms of how it's been made, uh, how the grapes have been grown. So that's going through natural factors, human factors, and then how it affects the style of wine. And that is really how questions will be structured for you. This one is actually jumping right in here in the human side of it. So the human influences in the winery, because it's asking why it, is this wine going to be sweet? To be honest, this could be a label of any port, uh, any red port from your syllabus. Um, there are some dry white ports, but you are not required to know those for the level three certificate. So why is it sweet? Um, so it is sweet because due to the fortification process, that is the addition of grape spirit, 
called Arguidente at 77% ABV. This kills the yeast that was fermenting the must, uh, and that creates a stable sweet wine of around 20-ish ABV, uh, but plenty of sugar. And that will get you the four marks. It's understanding that it's due to its fortification process. You could add in there straight after fortification process. In fact, let's do that. So you are uh, a little bit, um, you know, let's putting in the right terminology. Just add here, put in during form in, uh, fermentation, just here. Okay. Uh, why am I doing this? Because when um, you revise your um, your sherry section, that is actually after fermentation. Uh, so you you make a dry wine, then you fortify, and you have a dry fortified wine that may be sweetened later. But with port, the fortification happens during its fermentation. That's what kills the yeast, and that's what leaves residual sugar behind in the wine to make it sweet. Um, so they quite like you to know that big difference between port and sherry. So I would certainly add that in there. Um, describe the maturation process that this wine is likely to go through. It is an aged tawny port, 20 year old. Now, you, we actually haven't talked about this. That's on part three so much, but we talked a little bit about what to expect. Uh, this wine will undergo an average of 20 years aging in small oak barrels called pipes which will oxidize wine, the wine. You can easily put in uh, characteristics such as tertiary, um, almond, marzipan, walnut, um, et cetera, are produced from this process. It is an oxidized, oxidized characteristic. So three marks there. Um, pipes is important on that one. How will this impact the wine? Ah, so they're actually asking you this next. This wine will have a tawny color due to the oxidation, fine. Uh, and the primary fruit will fade, becoming raisiny. Complex tertiary characteristics will be produced like walnut, coffee, chocolate, caramel, marzipan, almond, all those kind of things. OK, uh, so that really is the second part done. So I hope you have enjoyed this section on port and you are understanding it much more. Um, really please understand that port as well as sherry, so your fortified section plus sparkling will be a written question in your examination. So it is very, very important that you study this part. Um, so just to reiterate, this is the second of three parts on port. The third part is only for our members on the e-learning platform on Wine with Jimmy. Please click on the link in the description below this video to go along to that and to subscribe to it. Um, but thank you so much for your time. I've been Jimmy Smith of At Wine with Jimmy, uh, West London Wine School, South London Wine School here in London, United Kingdom, and Streatham Wine House, my bar in the same city. Next time you're in London, please come and see us for a class, a glass, or even a bottle. Adios. Thank you so much.